Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Get $25 off the Ring Video Doorbell when you go to ring.com slash knowhow. On this episode of Know How, the next generation of internet over microwave. Shame your ISP. And an easy way to upgrade your Arduino project. Know How is next. Know how it's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next minutes, we're going to be showing you some of the projects that we've been working on so you can take them home and geek out on your own. Yep, yep. We've been geeking out hard all weekend, right? Just for this? Uh, yes, we're going to talk a little bit about how hard that geeking out has done. <laughs> uh, yeah, involving party. crashes. Oof, we're not yeah. getting into that right not, now. No, yeah. no, we're not going to start off with that because what we want to start off with are microwaves. Uh, okay. I like microwaves. They're very important, Brian. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how else am I going to heat up my steam buns that no, you bring me? No, well, actually, yes, it is the same microwaves, yeah. but specifically I'm talking about the microwave delivery of data. Now, when we think about internet speeds, yeah. the fastest thing is fiber, right? It's always fiber. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what could be faster than the speed of light? Exactly, yeah, except that fiber is actually slows down light a bit. Yes, this is one of the things that a lot of people don't quite understand, which is the speed of light is constant through a particular medium. So it's different from being in a vacuum, from being underwater, from being in glass. Mm -hmm. Now, if you transmit light through glass, the fastest it will go is about 200,000 kilometers per second. <laughs> okay, which is so fast, pretty fast. Which is fast yeah, yeah. But in a vacuum, it's 300,000 kilometers per second. That's a little bit faster, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what, we, what we've learned is that uh, there are some researchers uh, over at MIT, and I think it's like the University of some Pennsylvania. I don't smart know, guys. SAP, smart, some, some University smart guys. of smart guys. University of smart people mm -hmm. have been working on a solution to divide the traffic that you, get, you use into what needs to be delivered really quickly and what needs to be delivered in a big bunch. Okay. Right. And there's a few cases that people want data really fast, like faster than anyone else can get it and maybe give them an advantage? Well, yes. So uh, with stock traders, this has already been used. You've got stock traders who have set up microwave links between New York and Chicago. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're using that super slight advantage, just a couple of milliseconds over a fiber network by using microwaves. And by using microwaves, they might get a financial bit of data like five milliseconds before everybody else. But in, in the world of, of fast trading, that is basically a, a crystal ball. <laughs> okay. Right? That's not like cheating, is it? Or... <laughs> it's a gray area. It's, it's yeah. a gray area. If you, if you can build the fastest line, then I guess that it's all the more power to you. Yeah, the SEC hasn't really caught up with that yet. And actually, it's very dangerous because the only way to take advantage of those crazy fast transaction times is to use a computerized trading system. <laughs> and computerized trading systems will cause flash crashes, right? which is bad. We don't mind that. <laughs> well, going back to microwaves, I mean, it, we talked about that a while where there were all these stations that were left over from years ago that had been pretty much abandoned, right? Yeah, yeah. So we were talking about these. This is the long line across the United States. This is how we used to transmit data across the country. You know, we had these microwave towers that were normally on the tops of hills and mountains, and it allowed us to beam data via relay stations from station to station to station to station. Now, you could go back to that, that episode of know-how and actually see what that entails because those stations are actually very cool. It's a nice piece of history, but they were abandoned because they just don't have the bandwidth. Well, you started running into the, yeah, the, the uh, physics. barrier of physics. Yeah, you're right. into physics. You Which just can't signal any faster. Same thing that's happening with fiber. Well, th it's, a different, it's a different problem because in fiber, you can cr carry a massive amount of data. So it's kind of like the opposite of a microwave tower. You can do a lot of data 
but it's slower than a microwave tower. A microwave tower is faster than fiber, but you can't push much data through it. Oh, that's fascinating. Right. So what they've hmm. done is they've said, wait a minute, we can now start to play with people's psychology. It's the internet is as fast as you think it is. I mean, Matt, remember this. Imagine this. There, there's okay. going to be people in our audience who remember this. <laughs> when you were using a 300, not no, 300 baud modem, we called it baud back then. Huh? Baud. I don't know. Me and Alex are from the days of 56K, right? Alex saying we were calling each yeah. other up so, to play Doom. Well, no, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. So I started with 300. And then we went up to a, like a 14.4, and that was, it felt so fast. Like, why would I ever go back to 300? <laughs> it's the same thing here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not necessarily that it's so much faster. It just feels faster. And, and they figured out a way to capture that feeling by transmitting everything that needs a lot of bandwidth over fiber, right. but transmitting the stuff that needs to arrive quickly over, over the microwave, microwave link. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like if you're imagining like a freeway, there's the slow lane for all the cargo um, trucks and then the carpool lane for like the fast right, traffic. Right, right. Yeah. Now th this is actually this is an interesting thing here because this is we're not just talking about microwaves. This is a very interesting network technology. This idea of bonding channels. So you're bonding Bond. something that's very fast but very limited bandwidth yeah. with something that's slower but huge amounts of bandwidth, almost an almost infinite amount of bandwidth. You can't just connect both of those up to a computer and say, okay, right. I'm faster now. You do need some sort of system at both ends that will figure out what traffic needs to go fast and what traffic can go slowly, oh. and then recombine them at the other end so that the client computer can see just a single stream. So like a traffic control, like an air traffic controller or Like something. an air traffic controller. Yeah. Well, we actually had it. Uh, you were, you might remember this. I mean, you're, you're old enough for this. Do you <laughs> okay. remember when they, I think it was US Robotics that released the shotgun modem? The shotgun modem? The shotgun. And the idea was you had, it was a modem. But <laughs> it was it had, a two barrel? Yeah, yeah, it had two <laughs> phone lines. And you, oh. can, you, could, you could use both phone lines. It would dial both, and then it would do what was called bonding. The problem is you needed another shotgun uh, at, the other end. at the other end. Oh, okay. Right, so this is sort of the same problem. Unless you've got something at the other end that will, will decode what you're doing, it, it doesn't work. Okay. So cool tech. Yeah. It, it might take a while. Well, and uh, isn't the it kind of cost prohibitive to try and install more fiber, whereas like with the microwave stuff, it's probably already set up? It can be. It yeah. can be. And, and that's that's the thing. I mean, we are now at the point where there's so much infrastructure that's deployed around the world, not just in the country, but around the world, that mm. there's probably going to be something you can take advantage of. And that's mm. what they're doing with the microwave. It's like we've moved away from microwave technology, so there's a lot of stuff you can buy cheap. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, who knows? Maybe uh, your future internet might also help him heat up his hot pockets. I like hot pockets. Hot pockets. <laughs> mm. All right, Brian. I, I want to move on to something that uh, well, we promised to the audience a while back, and uh, we're now delivering. Do you like your ISP? <laughs> uh, I don't really have a choice, do I? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. That's that's another discussion. We're not going to get into that. But yeah, yeah mm. most of us hate our ISPs. Yeah, I, I think I would fall into that category. Fortunately, I haven't had to deal with Comcast is my ISP right now. Um, so that actually has worked out for me. As soon as I have to deal with them, though, I, I hate everything. What is the most, and this is not just for your ISP, the most frustrating thing that you can have as a tech person hmm. when you're trying to fix a problem? <laughs> when you're trying to fix a yeah. problem? Uh, phew, I don't know. What, what, uh, I'd say it's... Figure. It's the intermittent problem, right? Oh, it's you, where you, you can't you can't pinpoint it. Can't pinpoint it, and, yes. and like the tech comes over and it's like, well, it wasn't working ten minutes ago. Right. Fix oh, it. I know exactly. Yeah, that right? happens to me all the time. Where like uh, I'll be playing a game and then all of a sudden I'll get a lag spike, and then I'll go on my laptop and I'll do you know a speed test and it's fine. Everything looks fine. It here, checks sir. out. I yeah. don't know what's wrong with your equipment, mm -hmm. right? Well, and, then they try and get me to change my modem. Is what exactly, they and and actually that's that's the part that I really hate. It's it's saying okay, well. Every day between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m., my <laughs> yep. connection goes down. I know. I actually that that has been happening to me. Yep. I, I stay up a little later than I should, but at exactly 12:30 every night, <laughs> I'm watching out. something on Chromecast, oh, and it just right? cuts out. It's fantastic. And, and then it picks up like five minutes later. It happens like three times, four times a week. And if you call up your ISP, they're going to tell you, "Oh well, everything looks fine on our side. All of our equipment says it was green, yeah, so it must be sure. something wrong with your network." Wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice, Brian, if you had a way? to easily and freely, so uh -huh. it's not going to cost you anything, 
to document exactly what's going on. And then I would be able to use that information to shame them. To shame them, or <laughs> even, I mean, or to give to like a technician right, and say, to help Look, them, yeah, sure. This, I'm not imagining this, this is what I saw. <laughs> I swear I'm not a crazy person. Well, You're driving me crazy. Let's not go that far. But wouldn't that be nice? I mean, something that you could do easily, something that everyone could do, no matter what your operating system might be, and something that you could do now. I have a feeling you're about to show us. I am. Hey, Alex, press the magic button. Documenting your bad connection starts with getting some basic information about your network. These instructions are for Windows users, but Mac users should be able to follow along using Shell. And Linux users, well, you already know how to do all this, so I'm going to give you all a gold star and ask you to sit outside. Open up a command prompt and use the command ipconfig to bring up your IP address information. You can also use ipconfig slash all for a more complete inventory of your IP networking configuration. Document your IPv4 address and your default gateway. In my case, the client resides at 192.168.0.15, and my gateway is at 192.168.0.1. This gives me my first hop on the network, meaning that my client is one step away from my gateway. If you want to speed up the process, create a shortcut for the command prompt to make it easier to open up multiple command windows. Open up a new command window and ping your default gateway. In my case, I type ping 192.168.0.1 space dash T. The dash T switch turns this into a continual ping request to the gateway, your first hop. As each ping gets back to your client, you get your ping time. Since this is your gateway, the ping time should be extremely low. Typically 1 to 2 milliseconds for a wired network, sub 15 milliseconds for a wireless network. If it goes higher than that for an extended period of time, you may have issues with your internal network. This gateway address is good to have, but if it starts with 192.168, then it's a non-routable address, and we want the first hop past your internal network. This will require you to get into the interface for the device supplied by your ISP. In my case, it's a Cisco DPC3825 DOCSIS 3.0 gateway. Upon entering the interface, I can find the default gateway of my router. This is the first hop for my router, which means I now have a path from my client to my router to the first point of contact with my ISP. Again, document everything. More experienced users will tell you to use Traceroute, but I'm going to give them a gold star and tell them to go sit outside with the Linux guys. With this new information, open up a new command window and start a continual ping of your router's default gateway. In my case, it's 24.253.19.1. As the window populates, you'll start to see ping times to that second hop that you can compare against times to the first hop. That's important because it means that you know how long it takes to get to the end of your network and to the edge of theirs. Typically, I like to have a third or fourth ping running to a popular service on the internet, something like Google at 74.125.228.110 or to open DNS at 208.67.220.220. Accessing those services will take you through your ISP's network to a handoff with another network. Once you've got your pings running, you can start looking for patterns and in increased latency. I've taken screenshots and screen caps that I can show to my ISP tech when he doubts that I'm having a problem with their network. In this example, pings to my internal gateway average 1 millisecond. To the ISP's edge takes 7 to 14 milliseconds, and to Google takes 56 milliseconds. That's actually average. What I want to look for is when I can still get to my internal gateway and to the edge, but not to an external service, or when that external service takes an extraordinary amount of time, something past 1,000 milliseconds or more. That's when you know that the problem is past your network. This doesn't always guarantee action, but at the very least you can shame them by posting their atrocious pings onto the internet. Uh, this very is nice. sad to say. Hmm. But the shaming often works much more quickly than trying to reason it out with the tech. <laughs> I hate, I mean, I don't like to say that, but it's so true. Yeah, well, what ends up happening when you call over the phone, too, is that you get, like, the scripted kind of response. Right, I mean, you're not talking to a no, tech. You're talking to someone who has a manual in front of him or her, and they're reading it going, well, hold on, have you tried turning off the modem for 30 right. seconds and is, turning it back is on? Is your computer plugged in? <laughs> Yes. 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 <laughs> is it on fire? No, no. No, not this time. But what this can do, this is, I mean, ping is probably the most versatile network tool we use, we have. I mean, I've got gear. I've got gear, a very expensive gear, <laughs> that can tell me exactly what's going on in the network, and, but 
the ping is on every device I ever need to use. It's, in yeah. fact, it's on my Android phone. It's on uh, OS X. It's on Linux. So it's on Windows. So it's it's a really good resource to know how to use. And if you know how to interpret it, yeah. it's even better. So what we did in that example is we ping, had one window that was pinging to the internal gateway. So that's that's to my the edge of my network. Right. Then we pinged to the edge of the ISP's network. Then we pinged beyond the ISP's network. And it tells you very clearly what's happening. If you're not getting to that first ping, there's something wrong with your network. Right, there's something there, yeah. If you can get to the first ping, but not to the second ping, there's probably something wrong with the modem or the actual ISP's network is down. And then the last one... Then you know that you're getting into the ISP's network, but it's not getting out of the ISP's network. And then that way you can make an informed kind of decision on when you call them or send them Yeah, a, like, you can say, hey, email. look, I can ping inside your network all day long, but the yeah. second I actually try to get to something on the internet, it fails. So obviously there's a problem with you. It's not with me. It's not with my DNS settings. Right. It's not with my, my internal network. You've got something that's busted. Yeah, I like that idea. Because yeah, yeah. far too many times have, have things happened to me and I haven't had a way to prove it other than saying, you guys suck. Yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> I, I will say, this is, not, this is not a gotcha. Don't go to your ISP and say, oh, I've got 15,000 hours of pings. And they will have no idea what you're talking about. Print, the, print out all your pings <laughs> exactly. and, the, and bring the stack with you to Comcast or something. But yeah. I, I have noticed, especially with Comcast and Cox, if you just mm -hmm. put the, like, at Cox or at Comcast and, oh, you and say, then look at cap. my ping times, you will get a call. Nice. Th nice. That's actually how uh, I had this problem in Vegas, uh, our family home in Vegas. Like I said, every morning at yeah. 2 o'clock to about 6 o'clock, we would lose connectivity. And they swore it wasn't them. This was literally something that went on yeah. for like 10 years. <laughs> Until finally I got fed up and I just ran a ping test and I started yeah. posting the screens to, to Twitter. And the next day they came in, they replaced the piece of faulty gear that had been there for a decade. <laughs> and it fixed it. So, Everything fixed. All right. So what, from your experience, what would have been going on with that faulty gear? It what was, was just, wrong with it? It was a bad, it was a bad amplifier. Oh, okay. That was all it was. That was it. And I, w I had told them that like <laughs> six months into the problem. I'm like, I think it's right. the amplifier. It's obviously in the street. And then they say, oh, we'll send a guy between 8 and 6 o'clock. Yeah. So. And the problem is I didn't live there. So they would yeah. talk to my parents and they, they would just, oh, you know what? It's your cable modem. Let me just replace that cable modem. <laughs> and that's yeah. actually why we stopped buying. Because yeah. every time we would buy, they uh -huh. would say, oh, no, that was the wrong one. You got to rent it from us. Yeah, they told me that years ago. Yeah. I think it was about three or four years ago they tried to get me to change my modem. And all they, ha all I had to do was go call, complain, they reset it, and I haven't had a problem since. Okay, wait. <sighs> I, kind of, I know, right? Venting, I'm getting Google? angry just right thinking now. about it. Yeah. Not all, not all ISPs are bad, and actually they do a great service, but yeah. sometimes they need a little shaming. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. so, you know. yeah. What you is know, it? You know who doesn't need shaming, though? Uh, I think uh, our next sponsor, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, uh, let me ask you about this. Uh, what would you do if you could have something that was very easily installed mm -hmm. that would let you find out who was coming to your front door at all times? I but would Not love necessarily that. just ringing, yeah. but just coming into the vicinity of your front door. Well, I'm one of those people that hates going to the front door and answering it if it's not somebody I know. And I, what I always end up doing is peeking around the window and opening up the shade to see who it is. And then they look over and I try and pretend like I'm not home after that. <laughs> what if I told you there was a way to do that without getting up, just from your smartphone, from your tablet, and you didn't even have to be in the house to do it? You had me at not getting up, Padre. <laughs> and it's ring. Now, uh, I do have a really cool story about this. This last weekend, I was in Las Vegas. I was spending some time with my parents. And we've actually had trouble because they live in uh, one of these elderly communities. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's like a semi-gated community. They've had a lot of break-ins because they, there's a lot of people who know that many of these homes are used as sort of vacation homes. Right. Or they're elderly people and they won't fight back. And I was actually kind of scared for my parents. So once Ring became a sponsor, I actually bought a Ring. I brought it over. I installed it in about... I'd say eight minutes. Now, here's the cool thing. I, I, this is totally off script. This is not supposed to be in the app. I'm going to do this it anyway. This is your anyways. personal phone. This is this is my personal <laughs> phone. Which uh, let's 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 do it over here. There we go. So this is the device that's over in Henderson, Nevada, right now. And I can find out this. They missed a call, so someone came to the door, and it, it actually recorded? did a recording of who came to the door. Now this thing is freaking awesome. Uh, the nice thing about this is it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a ring. Even I have it set up with motion detection, so if somebody comes up to the threshold and starts speaking, peeking through the windows, yeah. I can actually see high-definition video 
of the person, and it will record every single event. That's a really wide angle lens, too, so you get a pretty good picture. It, it's 180 degrees. It goes all the way to the side. And I mean, this thing is, it's, it's really changed the way that I've set up home security for my, for my parents. Now, take a look at what's in this kit. If you buy one of these, you're gonna get this. This is their installation kit. And when they mean insulate, when they say installation kit, they it mean it. It comes with everything. It's everything. Not only do you get the, the, the doorbell, the video doorbell, but you're gonna get the tools, the drill, the, the, the bits, the level, and all the screws that you need to put this thing into play. And not only it will run on the uh, existing hardware if you have a yes. doorbell, but it also comes with a battery, right? Exactly, so I was able to wire ours into the existing doorbell power, which is nice because then it also lights this up so people know, oh no, that's actually the doorbell. Wait, wait you just want to make the sound, don't you? I like the sound. <sighs> No, but it also runs on internal power. I mean, because we don't have it plugged into anything right now. You could just charge it with this. It's a little USB port, micro USB. One charge will last you for a year. Hmm. Now, here's the cool thing. Once I had this set up, I was actually walking around the house. <laughs> and it's like a little video camera. Right, it, like a little GoPro in. or something. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I tell you. I mean, something like this really does revolutionize a part of home automation that most of us have taken for granted. You know, we've upgraded our home security, our cameras, our thermostat, our home automation. Yep. I haven't done anything with the doorbell. And that's right. probably the thing that I use day in, day out that I would rather have automated, especially the fact that you can change the sound so my dog right. won't freak <laughs> out every time he hears the door. Uh, see, oh. If yeah. Tibbs was here right now, he would be barking. Yeah, it's the same thing for us. Flipping his lid. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to get one of these for my sister because we have the same problem with our little Pomeranian. If it hears a doorbell, we'll just start barking. But if they hear like a piece of music playing, <laughs> they don't care. No big deal. Yeah. yeah, it's just that sound is ingrained. Yeah. I got to tell you, folks, you got to try Ring. Now, right now, Ring is doing a special offer here with Twit TV. Because they love us and because we're just so much into them, if you order with them right now, you can get a Ring video doorbell for only $174. That's $25 off the normal price. And imagine what you get with that. You get essentially caller ID for your door. You get a device that could stop the 95% of home break-ins that happen during the day. You could install it in minutes. You could have either battery power or line power and you can put your mind at ease. Isn't that worth it? I'm a believer. It's what I use, and I ask you to use it too. Protect your home and have a peace of mind with Ring. Just go to ring.com slash know-how. That's ring.com slash know-how and save $25 off your purchase. Do it now. Do it for your parents. Do it because it's cool. Do it for your dog. Do it for, do your, for your doge. Do it for your Tibbs, your Corgi. Yeah. All right, now, we've gone from something very practical Yes. Right, something that everyone can use. I, we, we never do two practical segments. <laughs> no, why <laughs> would we? No. That's just That's silly. That's just not how we roll. No, no. So what we thought we would do is we'd take a trip back over to Maker Faire and take a look at a company that's trying to give you an easy way to connect your Arduino project to the Internet. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Once you've got your Arduino project together, there's one thing that most makers are going to run into, and that is, but well, how do you connect it to the internet? If you want to be a part of the internet of things, you've got to be connected, which is why we're here at One Shield, and I'm speaking with Amr, who has, well, a unique technology that allows you to use your phone to put your Arduino on the net. Amr, what is this? Well, uh, One Shield basically allows you to communicate between the Arduino and a smartphone in a really easy way. So whenever you want to buy hardware shields, you don't have to because you already have all the hardware in your phone, right? So your phone can connect to the internet. It has a lot of sensors, a lot of capabilities. And we made that happen with the Arduino. So we designed an app and a board. The app opens the sensors and capabilities. And the board has a Bluetooth module that communicates back and forth between the smartphone and the Arduino board. If I have a smartphone, I have an amazing cornucopia of sensors, everything from, from accelerometers and gyros to, to just a really nice communication platform. You've given me access to that through Bluetooth. Yeah. Now, right now you work on Android. I know you're working on iOS, but iOS, but how... How does this actually work? How would I connect to my Arduino device? Okay, perfect. So it's, it's really simple and easy. So first, you get the board itself, you hook it up on top of the Arduino, and then you have an app on the Android phone. 
This app opens the phone sensors and capabilities. So you have the accelerometer sensor, it guesses the X, Y, and Z coordinates, right? Or you can make phone calls from uh, the Arduino itself, so it goes both ways. So you control the, the Arduino itself from the phone, or you control the phone from the Arduino itself, right? I love the fact that this looks complicated, yeah. but it's actually really simple. You've got four servos that are driven straight off of an Arduino board, exactly. and then you've got the one shield in there so that you can actually control the motion yes. of what it's doing. Exactly. So it's really simple. It's really one line of code. What you get is the data of the accelerometer sensor, and then you do a mapping function between the servo motor and the accelerometer data. So whenever you move your phone left, it moves left, and this right, and so on. And you know what's, 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 what's good at the smartphone is a lot of sensors. So you know what that is? A proximity sensor, so you can use it also to uh, grab things up, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if they want to find out more about One Shield, maybe get one for their their making kit. Where can they go? Well, uh, our website is OneShield.com with the double E, OneShield.com. You can know more about the shields. We have over 40 of them. NFC color sensor, all in only one device, which is the One Shield. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you very much for sharing your vision for a, a smarter Arduino. That's Atmel and One Shield. The Internet of Things just got smarter. Thank you. Uh, that is probably the easiest way to hook up your Arduino to something else. Because Arduino that was is cool. It's, it's so cool because it's lightweight and it's easy to use, easy to program. But getting it connected to something is not necessarily... That gets a little tricky. Yeah. And <laughs> so I didn't realize he had it connected to his phone when we were <laughs> shooting that. So I went in to get a shot of it and it started freaking out. And I'm watching him talk to you and he's gesticulating with the phone. I was like, oh, okay, now so, I get it. That's cool. Okay. The, yeah, the arm wasn't just trying to be difficult. It wasn't just being a jerk. <laughs> he just wasn't paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, uh, again, we, uh, we know that there are some people out there who have had it up to here with quadcopters. So we're not doing a quadcopter project today. Instead, we're just going to talk about quadcopters. Specifically, we've got a couple of questions from our Google Plus group from people who uh, want some general information yep. about uh, what to do with their projects. This first one, we don't have a link. This was this was actually uh, a email that I got a long, long time ago, and I forgot to answer it. Oh, and then he tweeted so. me. He's like, hey, hey, man. Have you heard anything? Remember my question? Because so, still, I still, still need help with that. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm sorry. This is from Raimundo Diegas. Oh, I'm glad you said that. I know. You know Raimundo um, Diegas. Actually, a very cool guy. Guy, and uh, he asked a very simple question I think is, is important to know. He wanted to know the difference between opto and non-opto electronic speed controllers. Which I hadn't even heard of that. Right, yeah. because most of us are using non-opto. We're using yeah. what we, what we like this. This is the one I've been suggesting. This is That's the, the ready uh, to fly quads. Yeah, the ready to fly quads. This is that 30 amp one that I like so much. It's $10, it's bulletproof, it works really well, and it comes with what's called a BEC, a battery eliminator circuit. That's what allows me to power my, my onboard electronics with this, rather right. than having to run a, sev a separate uh, power distribution for the radio and the flight controller, etc. Correct. Right. So this this is what what my basic ESC looks like. Right. There is this. This is what's called an opto ESC. And if you take a look at this, we'll, we'll, we'll put them opto. side by side. You'll see the difference. First of all, tiny guy. It's a tiny little guy. So it is lighter. It is smaller. The reason why it's smaller is this doesn't have a battery eliminator circuit. So this does not supply five volts to the receiver and the flight controller. Okay, so what's, what, why would that be then? Well, the reason for it is because when you start running really high power applications or when you start to do multi-rotor craft, mm -hmm. if you have all of these ESCs with battery eliminator circuits, you actually run into a problem where the EM being generated by them actually starts to disrupt the craft. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and, and you actually see this in high power applications. Huh. So, and the problem is, because of that battery eliminator circuit, you are linked, your flight, so your onboard electronics are linked to the motors, which are ridiculous EM generators. Right. I mean, they just, it's basically their- That's what they are, yeah. That's what they do. They're creating yeah. electromagnetic interference. That's how motors work. Huh. This isolates the electronics. So this, this is, there's an actual separation between the control side and the power side. So the situation that you would want to use this is if you had something more than four rotors? Or? Right, like for example, the octo, the octos Octo that I built, the uh, both the straight octocopter and the X8, yeah. I used these opto controllers because I didn't want stray EM getting into my flight controller and making it go crazy. Okay. Which I was actually getting a lot. I started with standard uh, BEC ESCs, uh -huh. and I was like, every once in a while, it would kind of freak out, and I didn't understand why. I, I looked at all my inputs. 
And it was, um, it was uh, one of my friends on the internet who said, let me guess, you've got BECs in all your ESCs, right? He said, I'm like, yeah. He goes, try to replace them with Opto. See if it gets yeah. rid of the issue. Now, let me explain how this actually works. So if you go to this, the, yeah, okay. So in this, you've got power coming in here, right? Mm -hmm. This is where the motor's connected to the three leads. Right. So the power comes, comes in here. It gets split off. Five volts of it goes down the control line. And that control line goes into the flight controller. And the flight controller gives power to the receiver, okay, right? Okay, yeah. But it's directly connected to these leads, which is which means it's all one system. So right. any interference you have in the system is going to propagate to the entire system. Okay. This, there's actually an air gap oh. between the control interface and the power interface. And the way it does that is when the power comes in, it goes straight into the, uh, the, the controller, which goes to the leads. The way that this works is there's a LED diode and there's an LED receiver, and the control impulses are actually transmitted over a small air gap via light. What? Yeah. So, That's and then, cool. So it, it gets turned from electrical impulse into light and back into electrical impulse, and that's what actually controls the ESC. So there is that air gap, which means <laughs> that electromagnetic interference will okay. not come back over the power lead into your, your control lead. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, I it's, had it's, no idea. It's yeah. awesome. What it does mean, though, is you now need to put another device in your quadcopter that can supply power to the flight controller, because these will no longer do it. Oh, uh, okay. So right. like a separate, just do a separate line a to separate, it? A separate line. So you need to go into a, like a 12 volt or 14 volt down into 5 volts to power the, uh, the ESC. Now, the one that I run, yeah. I went to extremes. I actually have <laughs> a separate power system, a completely separate. So it's not the same battery that runs the receiver and the flight controller. Is it much smaller? It's much, it's probably... much smaller. It's also the same battery that runs the gimbal. Oh, so okay. the gimbal... The, uh, the second receiver for controlling the gimbal, yeah. the flight controller, and the receiver are all on their own power system, and then the motors have a battery to them their, themselves. Okay, so yeah, you're breaking them apart. That's yeah. cool. Uh, so. It's more complicated, and <laughs> some people don't see the benefit of doing it, but when you start to get into crazy designs, yeah. you're going to find yourself using this more and more often. Besides, okay. if you feel these, I mean, it doesn't feel like much, but that it's actually a considerable amount of weight. So if you're really designing a performance craft, you can shave precious grams off by going with this. Because yeah, multiply it by four how many motors you have. Yeah. Right, because there's a battery eliminator circuit in each one of these. You only need one to power the entire craft. So I learned something, too, uh, over the weekend. These get hot, huh? Yeah. So you don't want these covered. if You, you, really like, don't. you don't want to tape them. You can. If I mean, you once. Yeah. <laughs> they, they tend to, they so tend I to guess, burn. is that the reason why they have this metal, Yeah, th it's that, kind of like a heat sink? This is actually a heat sink. So this takes the, uh, the heat that's being generated by the transistors in there, the gates, the PN gates, and it, it allows it to, to vent out. If you don't have that there, yeah, see, that's, thank you. That's, ah! that's exactly what we're, nice, quick on the button there, Alex. Very well done. Very well done. <laughs> Should we move on to our next question? Let's go ahead and move on. All right, so this one comes from Ray Davis, and he's got an unbalanced Alien X, so the bigger bigger quad. I'm about to complete my Alien X build, and I am finding it difficult to balance the quad. I'm using all the recommended parts, but unless I put another battery in the front, the quad is always tail heavy. Any suggestions? Uh, yes, uh, don't do that. Don't. Don't put another battery in it. No, I mean don't 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 unbalance it. Don't unbalance it. That's right. a good answer. There we go. Uh, moving on, on to the next, to the next no, question. Okay, no, let's let's answer for real. Yes, this is actually a very common problem. The thing is, the Alien X frame was designed to have a camera in the front. Right. So if you don't have a camera in the front, it's by design will be tail heavy. And there's no way to get well, around that. Well, I mean, you can. What you do is you actually put the battery like on the top, on top. plate, rather than in this little in the tail in the tail. Yeah. Uh, this is also a problem if you use a Mobius camera, because a Mobius camera is so much lighter than a GoPro in its casing. Yeah, because that's what, when I was flying around, I had the GoPro and it was perfectly balanced with the right, battery. Right. And unfortunately, you're right, there, there is no really good way to fix that. It's, it's the design of the craft. You can only do so much within the limitations of design. Hmm. Now, what I've actually done with this Alien X is, I've, I have beaten this frame to, <laughs> Not seriously. just I've you. I've used it so much. <laughs> I think that's uh, kind of the tendency we have. I, I've actually put a gimbal underneath here. Yeah. And then I've run the entire system with the non, uh, with the Opto ESCs, so I needed a second battery. So the camera was underneath, the battery was here, and they kind of balanced each other out. Well, it sounds like he's just flying it to fly it and not have a camera strapped to it. Right. So if you want to fly it just to fly it, what you want to do is you, you want to put, uh, like, like I actually, go to the side camera here. Uh, there's this piece of Velcro, 
and it just it will stick the battery on the top and then put a piece of velcro over the top just center the mass yeah and uh, and then do the same balancing you know just put your fingers in the holes here like see i mean actually go to the wide shot as you can see i i'm actually really tail heavy here yeah i mean and that's no battery no camera heavy. yeah then it's yeah. tail heavy yeah so that's what you would have to fight that doesn't even have a battery in the back yet in order to make this balance out you actually need to put some weight in the front to do that yeah because when you slide the battery into the little chamber down here and you put the camera at the front it's perfect, it's like, perfect. i didn't have any problem with right. that and that, that's what it was designed for right yeah and it's fun it is fun until so you hit your house hopefully that helps <laughs> I know it kills you. It kills you to add weight because you're thinking that's taking away performance. It's taking away flying time. Yeah. But not having it balanced kills performance and flying time even more. Yeah, the motors are fighting each yeah, other. So. Basically. Mm. Okay. It is a fun quad. I, I really is. enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the next question. Another, another quad question. <laughs> <laughs> I need my quad fix in the EU. This comes from Michael Branson. Hey, guys, does anyone have a good online shop for buying stuff for quads? Cop Turns? Cop turns. I haven't heard that one. Arduino and Raspies, plus possibly a selection of sensors for temperature uh, inside the EU. Hmm. Uh, yes. Yes? Actually, And yes. moving on. We don't need to, any <laughs> no. more information. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I did not put a link here. Alex, can you really quickly go to hobbyking.com? Hobbyking.com is actually where I started purchasing parts uh, before I found out about ready to fly quads and it's a global it's shipper. a global marketplace it they sell everywhere so they just actually got their USA warehouse open I used to have to buy from the the EU and they would have to ship mm -hmm. which was not no not fun no don't like that oh uh, this is actually where we got the, the, the remember the very first build we did the FPV 250 yes that came from Hobby King right uh, we, that was a kit it was okay. a kit we've since replaced it with something that's much better performance and actually a little cheaper. Mm. That's the that's the uh, the know how 250, which we're we're going to be building. <laughs> we're in a patenting weeks. that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but actually, actually, Alex, go back there. If you look under, uh, I believe they have it under uh, robotics and DIY. They do have an entire section there for Arduino and robotic kits. Right, you had it. There you go. So if you are looking for Arduino and Raspberry Pi sensors, huh. gear, this is a really good place to do it. And they have international warehouses. Uh, I, I won't say it's the cheapest thing ever, but the nice thing about using a global warehouse like Hobby King is they're going to have a lot of stuff in stock. So if you're looking to do a project, you're probably going to find it there. And it's actually, the prices are pretty good. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not like a local hobby shop, but uh, you will find more things and you will probably find it cheaper than uh, you would be able to get local. This is your best option. This is your best option. Okay, Yeah. cool. Yeah, there you go. In fact, I still buy a lot of stuff from Hobby King because... Uh, although I love Ready to Fly quads, mm -hmm. and I think uh, Paul Baxter is a great guy, and yeah. he's, been, he's been doing right by us. Uh, so, when I start doing the more advanced stuff, that's not what he's about. I mean, he's, no. he's about getting you your gear, getting you in the kit. If I'm doing something crazy, I still order from Hobby King. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, if you're not in the U.S., then it sounds like yeah, a good option. kind of limit your options. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, the next question we have is streaming FPV, and this comes from Jonathan Turner. With our local UAV group starting to talk about quadcopter racing events, very cool, uh, I've been trying to think of a way I can stream the races on a service like Twitch. Hmm. I think it's fairly simple to take the 5.8 gigahertz signals and lay them out split screen, but the hurdle I'm running into is bandwidth. Do you have any ideas for streaming in HD from a park or some other place without good Wi-Fi that wouldn't cost hundreds of dollars per hour? I love the idea. This is actually really, I love this. This is why I wanted to do this question. <laughs> I want this to be a reality, but I don't. Is it like, it's is, really hard. It sounds is, like it would be cost prohibitive, yeah. So, I mean, what you're talking about is obviously Ethernet is out. You're not going to have a wired connection. You're also Can't saying you there's no good Wi-Fi. Yeah. Just tie, tie an Ethernet up to your quad, <laughs> your yeah. Quad. <laughs> the umbilical. So what you're talking about is cellular. You're going to have to use a cellular. And I have no idea what carriers are good in your area. That's something you're going to have to find out. Yeah. Uh, thankfully... There is a lot of gear that's ready to use with cellular networks out of the box. The first one I would recommend, and actually I'm, I'm going to cut this uh, this little bit from our NAB um, uh, footage. Uh, it's the Teradect. Uh, Alex, if you go and go to their their uh, their website, Teradect is it's a device that allows you to put any input in, and then it, it'll stream it out. And it's good. It will work with Ethernet. It will work with Wi-Fi. It will work with 3G, 4G cellular hooked up via USB. So. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic device. It, it, 
it can get a little pricey. <laughs> uh, you know, you're looking at 500 to 1,000, depending on how you want to equip it. But if you want a drop dead simple solution, this is a really good way to do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's something else, the live stream uh, that you could use. This is the live stream broadcaster. It's basically a tarot deck. Okay. Uh, but they've bundled in the service. It's it's kind of a, it's not, I, I don't want to say it's bad. I, yeah. It's definitely got its use. Uh, it's a little simplistic for me, but the, the prices are lower. And the reason why the prices are lower is you have to use live stream service. Okay. So they, they lock you in. So the mm -hmm. tarot deck is sort of like I could use anything I want. When I use live stream, it's a tarot deck, but it's locked to a service. Is it is it much more inexpensive? Or? Well, you know, it depends how much you're going to use it, right? Mm. I mean, so if you're going to use it a lot, it, it, it might not be a good thing. But yeah. if you're going to use it once or twice a month, it might be worth it to get that lower entry price. So I want to try this out. Do we have the live view backpack? We, we have the live that? view backpack, but I mean, they're that, not going to they be able to afford a live, live view backpack. How much is the live view? Uh, Alex? Do you? No idea. Yeah, no idea. Yeah, <laughs> if you have more. to ask how much the live view backpack is, you can't yeah. afford it. It's a very expensive piece of hardware. It's great. It's a great piece of hardware. Because it, it has so all good. the different uh, cards. It's the bonding. 4G. Right, yeah, so bonding. what they've done, is they've bonded multiple networks, which we just talked about at the start of the show, which yeah. means their device has to be able to take that, connect through multiple services. Yeah. It goes back to their services, gets recombined, and then it comes back to us. So I believe it's a subscription model, so you yeah. pay for their service. You pay for the service, uh, and then and, you pay the per use. Yeah. For, yeah, so as long as you use it. <laughs> Leo, Lisa, can we go fly quads and stream it? Can please? we strap a live you yeah. to the bottom of a quadcopter? <laughs> <laughs> we want to do a racing event. It'll be fun, I promise. I, 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 think, I think the hardware is like 20 grand. A lot of outright. Yeah, okay, it's, so that might be out of the question yeah. there. The cheaper way to do it uh, is... The deck. Well, no, to use your laptop. So if you have a laptop, you have good service. Let's say Verizon, you get one of their, their USB dongles. Yeah. You could run software on your computer that would allow you to take multiple inputs. Now, here's the other thing. The yeah. input that you're going to get from the FPV camera, remember, we did it here in the studio, it doesn't look great. No, it no, really no. doesn't. Uh, it's low resolution, and it breaks up a lot. So you will be streaming a lot of that. What I've seen that works much, much better is if you just take if you have a GoPro on the, the quad, yeah, and at the end of the race, recombine it. That is so much more of a compelling video. I know it's not real time, but it's cheaper, and the final, the finished product is gonna be so much nicer. Yeah, I guess we, pro we just have to wait for the technology to get there, right? I saw one at NAB. It was, it was a really solid HD transmitter that was, it was about this big. And it could fit on a quadcopter. In fact, it was designed for quadcopters. They, they this for like news quality quadcopters. But it was six grand. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> strapping, <laughs> strapping that to my two hundred dollar quad. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and the other thing is, I mean, you need a way to lattice them together, right? Because yeah. you you want to be able to switch. Yeah. So like you'd be looking at a TriCaster Mini, uh, which is four to five grand. I really want to do that though. Can you imagine having like eight quads in the air doing a race, switching between each quad as you go, like using a TriCaster and streaming it? live yeah no i i would be mm. done with that the future ah <sighs> the future yeah yeah the future <laughs> hey, is, is if you have enough money you can do whatever you want the future I guess. Yeah. is money folks. <laughs> yeah, i wish all right now uh we do get to the part of the show that we haven't done for a while we haven't done a parting shot for like three weeks because somebody too busy somebody Somebody's keeps rushing you out of time they show us oh. a clock Boop. picture of a clock Boop. No, i don't think he has that input dying. right now <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> good but uh you had a little something something over the weekend we did want to take a look at it we, we're not going to show you the video we're going to save that for next week but yeah. Uh, yeah. You want to show them what happened to your uh, your alien ex? So uh, we built this for you. <sighs> yeah, be careful, careful with that arm there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you built this for me, and I have to say you put a lot of time and work into it. Yes, I, I did. Could, you balanced all the props. There's little pieces of tape at the bottom. Everything was really pristine. Was this I the loved first flight? It. Was this the first flight? Yes, outside? It, was. it was the first flight. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, this was the first flight outside. I got about 15 minutes in. So, you know, I was okay, coming like to the end of the ba a full, full battery. battery. Okay. Um, yeah, so I I'd like to say there is a little but, gust wait, that Alex, pushed it into a tree. I, I mean, if you take a look at this on the side cam, there doesn't seem to. Oh, actually, no, go back to the, the overhead. Go there to doesn't the seem to be anything wrong with this. Yeah, this, this looks perfect. What's, totally fine. What's wrong with this, Brian? Um, so, if you look closely, maybe if I do go to the side cam. Uh, there is a zip tie here, and there's two more zip ties huh. there. So if uh, I 
Oop, don't cut the don't wire. Don't cut the wire. Yeah, if I take those off, I'm gonna have to flip this bad boy over. It was a, it was like a, a process, you know. Fortunately, I had my garage right there, and I put it back together. And you know what? I flew it the next day. Oh, and it was no. fine. But this is <laughs> what it looked like after it hit the house. And it didn't fly so good right away. I could see, I could see there being a design flaw in that, uh, in that configuration. Credit to the 450 frame, though. Yes. I zip tied it together in my hodgepodge way, and it flew all day. I actually, you know, the next I didn't day. think it would because the, the, the first image that you sent me, you had duct taped it, or gaffer taped it. I'm that's like, that's how I found out that the ESCs get hot. They get hot. Right? <laughs> they start to boil and burn. And You're like, that's probably not a good idea, Brian. Maybe you shouldn't do that. <laughs> now we we wanted to show this to you because everybody we crash crashes. Yeah, everybody we, crashes. Yeah, we We were telling people, yeah, you know, fly your quads, send in your crash videos. Well, I have one now, yeah. and it was. Glorious? It was no, actually pretty glorious. It was pretty <laughs> yeah. glorious. It, was nice. it went out with style. Yeah. But you know, you learn from every crash. And the, the thing is, this ultimately, this is not an expensive crash because the <laughs> motors are still okay. The the props are hosed. We'll replace the, the props. The SC is still okay. It's an arm. It's one arm. And I was actually able, I, got, I have a present here for you. <gasps> this for is me? A, this is a complete 450 frame. I got this thing for like $13. So this is everything to build yourself a new 450 uh, frame uh, and now you've got replacement arms you've got replacement props <laughs> and I would recommend to everyone buy extra arms and props yeah. like we we have been recommending yeah. but uh you know it's actually probably for the best that the arm snapped like that because yeah. at, if it was more rigid something else probably would have broke exactly and, and that's what you got to remember uh, on the especially the larger craft the, the smaller mono craft they can take a hit because yeah. they're not that heavy no, so there's not a lot of they're not importing it. a lot of force and I definitely gave one of my friends a close shave. Did he uh, spill wine on himself? He spilled wine all of himself. But we'll save that for the video. We'll save that yeah, for the, the video. Yeah, the slow motion. Yeah, uh, if, if you don't, if the arms don't snap, something on the, on the frame itself will snap. And, and that would be more expensive. That would be yeah. even more expensive. What you don't want is you don't want the motor taking the brunt of the force or the ESC or the controller taking the, the brunt. She came out okay. She the did. Props got, arm. Props got messed up a little bit. The top of the caps got a little Scuffed. scratched, but... All in all, it's kind of a beast. It's a beast. Know? I was able to put it back together and fly it the next day. So. Now, the reason why this is a parting shot is uh, we realize we have neglected <laughs> It's our... a broken parting shot. Uh, yeah, it's a broken parting shot. We've, ne we've neglected our audience who does fly. Next week, we want to show you the proper procedure for post-crash. 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 So <laughs> not taping up your not ESCs. Not taping up, right. And mm. it's actually, it's also what you should have in your your, your, your crash box. Because you don't yeah. want to go out to a field, have one crash, and then you're done for the day. Yeah, definitely. Right. So we're going to show you the things that you should have in your box. We're going to show you the, the spare parts you should be having on hand. And we're going to show you the things that you really should do anytime you had, not, not just like a crash like this, but anytime there's a hard landing, there's a few things that you can do to extend the life of your quadcopter. Now we're cool. going to show that to you in the next episode. Yeah, I could have used that like yeah. last week. Well, I mean, <laughs> you really you're going you're going to love the video because at the end he's like, Padre's going to be angry. Yes. He's going to yeah. yeah, he's angry, angry. I'm like, no, this it's crashing is part of flying. I know. I was happy when you you sent me back the picture. It was just like the yeah. table of arms. Lots of like, arms. Don't worry, Brian. I have you covered. <laughs> and uh, yeah, when I whenever I buy parts, I always buy extras because I assume I'm going to break something. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need them. Uh, folks, we know that this has been a lot of information, so uh, we're going to make sure that you get all of our show notes if you want to find out about the procedure for using ping to, to shame your ISP. If you want to find out more about One Shield and maybe where you could get one of their shields mm -hmm. to Bluetooth enable your Arduino project, or if you just want to find out where Hobby King is and all our other cool stuff is, you could go to our show page, which is where, Brian? Twit.tv slash KH. Yeah, go and there and uh, you can you can also subscri subscribe, right? Subscribe to the video, download the audio if you so choose. It'd be kind of... Kind of difficult to follow along if you did that, but I'm not going <laughs> to judge you. Uh, that's <laughs> and you can enjoy the screen caps My from our Zeus last hat. week. I like that. Yeah, that was your. Uh, I think you were being attacked by a packet storm. <laughs> oh, that's, that's was, right. Wow. Yeah, very good. Very, very uh, well so yeah, check out our show page, yeah. Twitch.tv/kh. Uh, don't forget that we do have a uh, a Google Plus group, and it's 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 growing still. It's like 8,600 <laughs> people. <laughs> 8,000 quad strong. It, mm. Well, there's a lot of crash well, photos and a lot of crash videos in there, but also some very good projects. Uh, please join in. 
play around, post your projects, post your questions. We love to hear from you. We've got a lot of people in there who just answer questions all day. In mm -hmm. fact, it's hard for me to get in first because there's always someone in there working. It's it's that's it's why we call the them the know-it-alls. Yeah, and it's not you know a, a name for making fun of. It's they with the collective mind that pretty much everybody knows something. You are the no-hole. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> hey, yeah, what was it? Uh, Patrick. He said that we're the uh, oh, Twit R and D department. We have to get a sign. Yes, we will that's... no longer be known as the no-hole. It's the R and D department. Right. It sounds much better than the guys who break stuff also, in the basement. Also, an R and D department should get a budget, right? Maybe. <laughs> We're going to need more arms. We're definitely going to need more arms. Also, if you don't like Google+, you could always follow us on Twitter. You'll find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And I am... I was going to say, I'm at you, Brian Burnett. Brian, I no, wish. I didn't get that screen name. I am at cranky underscore hippo. Yeah. And don't forget our TD, Alex. You can find him at A-N-E-L-F-3. And L3... Oh, oh, and and I just I just want to say that once again we have delayed the know-how host cam uh, unveiling. Uh, so no. I was in Vegas. Actually, uh, I, I can blame Delta for that because what? That, those are currently in that bag. Oh, okay. So, yeah, Delta lost my bag. The audience has been clamoring for the host cam. Coming from coming <laughs> from Vegas to San Francisco, yeah. couldn't do it. Lost the bag. Oh, that's so Delta, huh? I didn't get until like three o'clock last night. Last I night? This morning. Oh, okay. I was I wondering was why you haven't been around. Jeez. Um, so you're going to sleep after this? I'm so going to sleep. You've been asleep for half I this have, episode, I have, haven't wait, you? Wait, what have we been doing? <laughs> you're like I, a dolphin I, where you turn off talking? half of your brain. Yeah. <laughs> half. <laughs> right. uh, until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas, sir. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go break it. Go break it. Oh, oh, oh.